What are the issues keeping CEOs awake at night? And how can business leaders help shape a more sustainable world that works for us all? I'm Halal Mohyuddin. Welcome to Global Perspectives from KPMG. Today's show, we're joined by a journalist who's been on the front line of political and economic news, covering deglobalization, international monetary policy, and financial markets. Mahreen Khan is the economics editor for The Times, and previously spent several years in Brussels for The Financial Times, focusing on the UK's departure from the European Union. Mahreen, thank you for joining us on Global Perspectives. Thank you so much for having me. Now, we've heard a lot recently about the risk of a global recession driven by the war in Ukraine and other major challenges. What's your analysis? Well, as we sort of sit here at the sort of midpoint of 2023, there's lots of good news and unexpectedly good news. And also, I think some dark clouds on the horizon. So maybe to start with, I think if we'd spoken perhaps towards the end of 2022, Most people would have expected this point to be the middle of a global recession. Most major countries were expected to fall into recession, given the state of energy prices putting so much pressure on household budgets and also government budgets. Uh, Thankfully, that hasn't actually happened. And and some of the factors involved in that are a little bit of luck. So winters across Europe and in the US were not as bad as expected, which means we use a little bit less heating. And the global oil and gas markets have also fallen dramatically in the last few months. We're actually now to level before the Ukraine war caused a surge in energy prices, which was a huge shock to most major economies. So the good news is that with some exceptions, Germany being the main one, the UK, the US and most of Europe is not in recession. The Chinese economy has emerged from a lockdown at the start of this year. That's given an extra boost to countries that have to export lots of things to China because they think their demand will come back. So that's the sort of good news story of the global economy. But there is an unexpectedly surprising, I think, sort of worrying part, which is that we're still talking about very, very high inflation in lots of major economies. I'm talking to you from London, where inflation just simply hasn't fallen as quickly as everyone expected, along with the energy prices. We're still talking about inflation, which is more than four times the 2% target of the Bank of England. In the Eurozone, we still have core inflation, which is a measure of underlying price pressures, which is which seems to keep going up, which again is another surprise. And in the US, that's also true. And we're in, uh, we were approaching a summer where central banks will have to keep raising interest rates, having done some of the most aggressive monetary tightening we've seen in over 30 years. And that's a huge surprise, not something that we expected. And the consequences of that will mean that perhaps interest rates will rise much further than people would have expected if you asked them in 2022. And I think maybe just going back to one of the the mixed parts of what we've seen is that most people still have jobs despite economies slowing down and the cost of living prices increasing. So labor markets have proven to be very, very strong. And so I think surprisingly strong because when we associate recessions or near recessions, the first thing people think about is, why am I going to lose my job? And that just hasn't happened. So we still have record low unemployment, which is great. For most people living in developed economies, they are staying in their jobs. They might be working a little bit less. Their employers might be trying to offer them flexible contracts, but they're not getting laid off. And that's obviously great for consumers. It's very good for governments, but it is a bit more complicated for central banks because it suggests that if people are staying in work and perhaps even getting quite major pay increases, then the inflation problem is not going to be going away anytime soon. Now, you've reported extensively on deglobalization, something we saw to an extent with Britain's departure from the EU. Is this something business leaders should be worried about? I think if you're a business leader or anyone who's been around a boardroom or around any sort of policymakers for the last 12 months, this is a buzzword that you will have heard quite a lot about deglobalization. And a lot of people sort of scratch their heads at this because it's quite a trendy word. Um, journalists like myself use it a lot. We report about this phenomenon, but it's quite difficult to actually understand what it means. And I think if I sort of give you a little potted history, um, when the pandemic hit and we had major economies basically going into hibernation, global supply chains were massively disrupted. 
Um, we had huge delays for goods coming in from other parts of the world. Imports and exports were affected. And that sort of raised the prospect that the sort of 30 years of globalization, which is the liberalization of trade markets, the opening up of borders, the movement of people all pretty much came to an end during the pandemic. And the question was raised was whether this was going to be permanent. I think there's a much more geopolitical element now, given the war in Ukraine and the fact that Russia has been hit with unprecedented financial sanctions and effectively been excluded from the global trading environment, that deglobalization may actually mean something that looks like the world economy sort of balkanizing into different regions. And those regions will be a lot, will be falling into a place depending on what country considers which other countries to be its allies. And the obvious cleavage in this geopolitical debate is between the US and China, which maybe we can talk about a little bit later, and countries that want to align themselves closer to China and those who want to align themselves closer to the US. Uh, and that's become a very antagonistic relationship in the global economy. I think in 2023, it's fair to say that the evidence for deglobalization, which is the actual reversal of globalization, is pretty limited. We're not really seeing evidence of it when it comes to trade, global trading environments. Um, we're not seeing the putting up of huge amounts of trade barriers. What we're just seeing is a slowing of trade, which I think is more a result of the slowing of the global economy. So perhaps deglobalization is maybe the dog that's never really going to bite. And I think in 2023, we can say that there are more nuanced versions of this story. And they're sometimes called near-shoring or friend-shoring or even multi-shoring. And that's based on speaking to companies, which you know I write about on a daily basis, and having lots and lots of anecdotal evidence that companies are choosing to perhaps move parts of their manufacturing, some of their head offices, um, some of their major operations from one country, say China, which is the case, I think, for Apple, and trying to find hubs in other regions so they have a supply chain which is diversified across countries and it means that they have a bit more inbuilt resilience in case there is a huge conflagration between the US and China, that their entire business is not stuck in a country which suddenly becomes a global pariah. And that is exactly what happened in early 2022 if you were a business who's, you know, you were sourcing main lots of your parts in Russia. Suddenly, you know, overnight, uh, Russia became a global pariah and you would have been in a lot of trouble. So multi-shoring is this idea that actually you have maybe a China plus one, plus two, and you're looking at other countries. Some of the winners are, you know, Mexico, India, Vietnam, Malaysia, the Philippines, countries with low labor costs. And they might be actually quite big winners from this sort of trend, which is the slowing of globalization. And I think a more complicated international picture for lots of companies when they think about where and how they want to do business. Now, CEOs are grappling with so many issues and challenges right now, from economic woes to the climate crisis. Any advice from you on what they should be looking out for in the future? I think, I think um, you should be very wary of taking any real business advice from a journalist. But from I think from my you know my talks to around policymakers and and people who are sort of looking at the global macro picture, I think the huge tail risk and something that has to be now on the radar of every business is, as I already mentioned, a major um, international trading disruption between the US and China and, and potentially the threat of conflict over Taiwan. And this is a huge geopolitical risk. And it is one which, if it does come to a head, you know, all bets are off for the global economy and most businesses. Um, we've already seen the impact that sanctions and financial sanctions can have on a country in Russia. And if any sort of degree of sanctions were placed by Western countries on China, then huge amounts of prosperity that we've been used to in the West, which includes access to lots of cheap goods, a relatively low inflation despite what we're already having, um, all of those things would be suddenly called into question. And that's now become a, a real risk in 2023 because the Biden administration has taken a particularly tough line against China. This includes banning the exports of chips. This also includes you know, the US wanting to uh, create its own supply chains for ma major green technologies. That's happening on a trading level. And there's also the threat of perhaps a Republican administration, which is likely to be taking a much more aggressive line with China. So I think the threat of a, of a major blow up between the US and China over Taiwan is something that is now uh, a subject which just cannot be ignored. So I, I'm sure that CEOs, you know, if they're ever speaking to US policymakers, this is one going to be one of the biggest concerns. And then there are sort of the short term things that we've already mentioned. I think one interesting thing is that 
for now, we've had an environment of rapidly rising interest rates, but households and even businesses haven't really felt the pain of those interest rate rises. And that's because a lot of this pain has actually been delayed. It's been delayed because people have fixed their loans on their houses for you know quite a long time and they won't be sort of seeing those higher rates until perhaps the end of this year. That's definitely the case in the UK. And I think it's if you're a business who, which has a clear consumer facing um, element that you're selling goods and services to people, you would have thought that actually 2023 has been a pretty sanguine and quite a benign environment. And it'll be interesting to see when signs of those pain come because uh, if you are a business who's just selling your goods, uh, you may find that your customers are pushing back against inflation, that they don't want to pay a little bit more every time they go shopping or they access your service. And that's going to force a lot of companies, particularly retailers, to rethink their strategies about how to maintain their customer base, whether they have to start slashing prices, what impact that's going to have on their profit margins. And and perhaps just related to that, we haven't really mentioned it, but it's the housing market. I think for lots of people who live in developed world countries, their houses, their you know, it's their most valuable asset. Again, we haven't seen a major housing downturn uh, in Europe, the US or the UK, despite there being threats of, you know, people having to pay more for their mortgages. Um, of course, we had a massive financial and housing crash in 2007, 2008. I don't think we'll be in a situation where that repeats. But if people are struggling to make repayments, if they go into arrears, the questions about repossessions, again, about job losses might be something that we might be talking about towards the end of this year and the beginning of 2024. And perhaps when all of that pain comes through the pipeline, I think that's going to be a massive, it's going to have a much bigger impact on businesses than anything we've seen so far, despite the fact that we've been talking about you know, hugely volatile financial markets and conditions for perhaps 18 months now. So these are the sort of short and I think longer term risks that should be on the horizon for any business. And, um, you know, how do you watch out for these things? It's about watching data. It's about speaking to people and um, looking at surveys, maybe reading the press if you want to. Um, uh, and, you know, barring any major disasters, you would hope that perhaps we can get through this period of pain with a sort of shallow and moderate recession and not something like the huge crashes that we've seen, you know, about 15 years ago when the entire global economy sort of fell off a cliff. Marin Khan, thank you so much for joining us on Global Perspectives. We're joined now by KPMG's Global Head of Clients and Markets, Regina Mayer. Regina, welcome to Global Perspectives. We've been chatting to Mehreen Khan about economic uncertainty and some of the impact it's having on businesses. What are clients and other senior business leaders telling you right now? Well, uncertainty is the absolute buzzword of the decade of the 2020s, because we've been dealing with uncertainty ever since the onset of the pandemic. And my view is that CEOs and business leaders of today are really quite adept at dealing with uncertainty. They have strategic plans. They've figured out how to be agile. They're focusing on the key aspects of their business that they need to manage. And then they're rolling with the punches, so to speak. What we've seen so far in 2023 is actually more economic buoyancy than any of our clients expected. And so they're taking the positives, re recognizing that the market may fall, we may not have a soft landing post-inflation and with the recession pending, but they're dealing with the uncertainty with agility and strategic focus. Now you cover a wide range of sectors, but come from an energy background. It's playing a significant role in so much debate and discussion right now from energy bills to the energy transition is it an industry in turmoil or is there light at the end of the tunnel for the big energy players? I definitely see light at the end of the tunnel. I think the industry has come to grips with the changes that they need to make. The energy transition is fundamentally underway. At the same time, we're demonstrating that we need hydrocarbons to continue to power the consumption and the demand that's being generated. Uh, we're seeing in July of 2023 what could be the highest demand ever for hydrocarbons, higher even than August of 2019 pre-pandemic. So the big energy companies have taken different strategies to be successful. Some are going to focus on renewables, wind, solar, renewable sources. Others are pivoting more toward the new energies of the old economy. Let's call it hydrogen, lithium for batteries carbon capture. The strategies are all becoming clearer. They're quite different. And I think that it's an industry that's coming to terms with the transition versus one that might get run over by a transition. 
CEOs and other business leaders, as we said, are grappling with such a vast array of challenges and uncertainty right now. What advice do you have for them on how to tackle the issues and plan for a long-term sustainable future? Well, one of the privileges of being in a role like this and with a firm like KPMG is that we have the privilege of having the ears of senior leaders. And if I were to be so bold as to give advice, the advice is to focus on what's core to your business. What do your customers want? What do your employees need? How do you maximize margin while you're delivering that? Don't overly focus on one mechanism versus the other. If you overly focus on cost, you might miss out in terms of what customer demand might be, and you might miss an opportunity to take on a new product or a new innovative service or a new wave that's coming like generative AI. So in the end, your customers and your employees are the key assets that you have. Stay focused on them while still managing the bottom line of the business and figuring out how to be nimble and agile as we all respond to the new changes that we deal with month to month, week to week, day to day. Regina Mayer, thanks for joining us on Global Perspectives. I'm Hala Mohiyadeen. Thanks for joining us this month. We'll be back again soon with another edition of Global Perspectives. In the meantime, you can listen to all the KPMG International's podcasts by searching for KPMG on your podcast platform of choice or by heading to kpmg.com.